Alexander White was a 19th century Scottish pastor who wrote a six-volume work on the various people in the Bible, character studies on those Bibles. He also wrote a two-volume work on characters from Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. So I've appreciated Alexander White for many, many years, but he was a bit eccentric in uh, the ways that he conducted his affairs. He had a bookseller friend who he had asked every time a new commentary on the book of Romans came out to send to him. And so the bookseller did that. And one time Alexander White described how he determined whether or not to keep the commentaries that were sent to him for his review. He said this, as often as my attentive bookseller sends me on approval, another new commentary on Romans, I immediately turn to the seventh chapter. And if the commentator sets up a straw man in the seventh chapter, I immediately shut the book. I at once send the book back and say, no, thank you. That is not the man for my hard earned money. Well, if he saw that Romans 7 wasn't handled well, that was enough for Alexander White to say, I don't want this commentary. And I have to confess, I do the same thing when I look at the book of Romans and its commentaries on it. When I have a new commentary that's suggested to me, I always go to chapter 7. Because Romans 7 is the most controversial passage in the book of Romans. 7, 14 through 25 specifically, which is the passage we're looking at today. And if a commentator skates over it and doesn't deal with it because it's controversial or because some things are hard or because some things are unpopular that it teaches, then I'm not going to trust him mostly for the rest of the book of Romans. And even those commentators who might disagree with my understanding of this passage, if they deal with it honestly and they acknowledge, yes, here are the problems and here are the challenges and here's what we've got to give full weight to, well, then I can appreciate that. So this morning as we come to this passage, we've got to zero in on the, the question that puts the issue clearly in front of us about what Paul means in Romans 7, 14 through 25. And if you answer this question, then you'll be prepared to look at the rest of these verses. You'll be able to expound them, to understand them. And so before we do an exposition, which God willing will take place or at least begin next week on Romans 7, 14 through 25, this morning I want to just address this question. Who is the man that Paul's talking about in Romans 7, 14 through 25? If we don't get that question answered clearly in our minds and accurately from the passage, then we're not going to be able to understand the specific things that Paul says about this person in using this person in his own experience to illustrate the points that he wants to make about the use of God's law. Our text is found on page 943 if you're using one of the Bibles provided for you, and I encourage you to get a copy of the scripture in front of you. I'm just going to read through these verses, and then I'm going to point to certain ones of them to help us think about this question, who is this wretched man that Paul is identifying in Romans 7, 14 through 25? So follow along in your copy of God's Word as I begin reading in verse 14 of Romans 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it's good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind 
but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. In these verses, the Apostle Paul continues his teaching, his explanation of the nature of God's law and its usefulness as it is being applied to people who are both believers and unbelievers. Specifically, what he has in mind is the Ten Commandments, as we saw last week when he told about how it was the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet, that God used to awaken him to the reality that indeed, as a Pharisee, as someone who had strictly tried to keep the law, that he himself was condemned by that very law. Well, what is the role of the Ten Commandments in the lives of unbelievers and believers? Paul has spent six chapters prior to the seventh chapter of Romans, laboring the point that the law cannot make you right with God. The law can condemn you, and it does for your sin. The law can stir up your sin within you and even provoke you to give yourself over to more sin, which it does at times. But the law cannot save you. Well, it was never designed to save sinners. And so there are people today who get very nervous to hear gospel-believing pastors and churches talk about God's law because they think, oh no, oh no, you're, you're trying to confuse people or you will confuse people and you'll make them think that if they only do enough, if they only keep the law, if they give more attention to the law, that they can make themselves right with God. Well, no, not at all. Again, Paul has spent six chapters making certain that we do not misunderstand that the only way to be right with God is by the power of His gospel in Jesus Christ. It is only through Christ that any of us are justified. Well, having spoke, spoken so diligently and sometimes harshly about the law, and it's having no place in our justification, Paul comes to this chapter, And he wants to make sure that people do not misunderstand and misapply what he has said. He wants to make sure that people are not concluding, well, then the law must be sinful. We saw this last week where he answers that question very directly. If you look at verse 7, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. The law is not sinful. Why not? Because it's God's law. God's the one who gave it. It comes from Him. The moral law is a transcript of His very character. It cannot be sinful. The very God who gave us the gospel to save us has given us the law to guide us. Now previously in our approach to Romans 7, I pointed out that verses 5 and 6 are really the key to understanding the rest of the chapter. If you look at verse 5, You see how Paul here gives a summary statement looking back on his life before he was converted. Look look at verse 5. He says, For while we were living in our flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit of death. Do you see his perspective? Where is Paul looking? Is he looking present? Is he looking future? Or is he looking past? Well, he's looking at what God's law is did, how it was useful in the lives of people before they become Christian, in his own experience. This is true in all Christians. He says, while we were living in the flesh. Brothers and sisters, before we became Christians, the law stirred up our awareness of sin. The law condemned us. Any right thoughts you and I had about our status before God, before He converted us, He saved us, was to understand that in His sight we were condemned because we had not measured up to what He requires. The law shows us how hopeless and helpless we are before God. Now Paul elaborates this point, the usefulness of the law to the unconverted, in verses 7-13. through That's where we spent time last week. But if you look at verse 6, Paul's perspective changes from past to present. He now is concerned about the work of the law in himself as a believer, as he puts it. But now, you see, we were previously, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve now in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. 
In other words, now that we're no longer under the law as a mechanism of trying to make ourselves right with God, as a covenant, as a way of being justified before God, we are free to serve God in the power of the Spirit because there's no condemnation to those who believe the gospel. The law doesn't change. It still demands perfect righteousness, but we no longer look at it as the way to become right with God. Our relationship to the law has changed because our relationship to God has changed. And that change has come not by law keeping or attempting to keep the law, but by Jesus Christ. So Christians do not look at God's law as a ladder that we must climb in order to reach Him. Rather, in the power of the Spirit, we are enabled, as Paul says it, to serve God. And what does it mean to serve God? To do what He commands, to keep His law. But we do so not by regarding the law as a ladder, but by seeing it as railroad tracks that keep us on the right path guiding us into a life of holiness and Christ-likeness. Now, Paul elaborates this point that he summarizes in verse 6 in the passage that is before us today, verses 14 through 25. Before we work work our ways through these verses, before we expound them here, I do want to first answer this all important question of who Paul is talking about. Who is this wretched man In Romans 7. And as we get that question clearly answered, God willing, this morning, then we'll be prepared to work through these verses in the weeks ahead to understand the point Paul is making about the nature of the law in the Christian's life and its usefulness for all Christians. Well, the scripture that I've read, Romans 7 14 through 25, in answering the question of who is this man, leads me to conclude. The man in Romans 7 is a faithful Christian. Paul uses his experience. He includes other believers in it in showing us how the law functions helpfully in the lives of believers. Now, this understanding, this answer has been what most of evangelical Protestant and Reformed teachers throughout history have believed. But there have been those, even very respected teachers, who have seen Paul as extending his description of how the law works in the life of an unbeliever in these verses. And so they say we should not make any strong division in verses 7 through 13 and 14 through 25. Paul's still describing the work of the law among unbelievers. Others see Paul here describing a faithful Jew who was living under the old covenant before the Spirit of God had been given in fullness. And so here is one who is A Jew, faithful to God, doesn't have the fullness of spirit, and therefore he cannot live in the victory that we know through the power of the spirit. Still others have seen this description in these verses as an experience of a person who's under deep conviction. Deep conviction. He's not yet born again, but he's on the way to being born again. Well, I'm convinced that Romans 7, 14 through 25, is setting before us the normal experience of a faithful Christian. Well, let's consider some objections to that point of view. Uh, One of them is, well, Paul says some things in these verses that a faithful Christian could never say. For example, uh, look at verse 14. He says, I am of the flesh. I am fleshly. Older translations put it more graphically. I am carnal, is what he says. I'm sold under sin. Well, how does that square with what we just read in verse 5 of this chapter where Paul describes what we used to be, living in the flesh, living in sin? How does it square with verse 14 of chapter 6 where Paul says, sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law, but under grace? Well, Paul's not talking here about being completely enslaved, captivated by sin. He's speaking as a man who has been justified before God so his sin is forgiven, but sin still remains in him. He's speaking in the same way that he spoke to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 3, when he rebukes them. He says, I can't write to you 
as spiritually minded people because you're carnal. You're earthly minded in these areas that he was rebuking them. He's not setting up what some teachers have done, that there are two classes of Christian, spiritual and carnal. You know, you, you both get to heaven, but the spiritual Christians get there in first class and you go as cargo. You know, you just kind of barely get in. Paul's not teaching that at all. What he's teaching is that as Christians who have been born of God's Spirit, there's still sin that remains in us. And if that sin is not regularly being dealt with, as he will go on to teach us in Romans chapter 8, then it can continue to divert us, make us think wrongly. It can lead us into temptations. It can dilute the things that God has taught us and is doing in our lives. Another of the statements in this passage that those who disagree with the thesis I'm setting before us this morning point to is verse 18. In the middle of that verse, Paul says, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. But wait a minute. Don't Christians have spiritual ability? I mean, doesn't Paul write in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me? Well, yes. Yes. But again, as we will see when we work our way through these verses, Paul here is not talking about an absolute status of having no power. He's looking at the standard of righteousness that Jesus kept, never once sinning in any deed that he did or anything that he should have done that he left undone, never once sinning in any thought, any attitude, any word that crossed his lips. And Paul wants to be like that. Every Christian wants to be like that. Don't you? Don't you want to be like Jesus? Well, Jesus perfectly kept God's commandments. And Paul says, I look at that as a Christian, as a believer. I I don't have the ability to be perfect in this, as he will later say, body of death. Another expression that's pointed to by those who say Paul couldn't be talking about a Christian is verse 24. When he says, wretched man that I am. Is this how a Christian who is a new creature is to think of himself? Can can anyone who's a child of God, anyone who's been born again, anybody who's been reconciled to God, anybody who's been declared righteous in God's courtroom, can anyone genuinely who's had those realities come to him say, I'm a wretched man? Well, if you understand what Paul is doing, how he's unwilling to lower the law and say, now that I'm a Christian, you know, we can, we can uh, look at the standard being less than it was before I was a Christian. If you understand, he's looking at Christ, the embodiment of the law perfectly fulfilled, and he sees that law, and he knows he's not done it. He wants to do it. He should do it. And the day's going to come, as he says at the end of the chapter, when it will be done. But right now, he looks at his inability, his not being completely conformed to Christ, And because of his sensitivity to that and his desire for that, he just feels like a wretch. He knows he's not what he ought to be. Another line of argument that is used, and this is more broad, and there's other passages of Scripture that are brought in to bear on it, against the thesis that I'm setting before us today that Paul's talking about a faithful Christian, goes like this. The internal struggle revealed in these verses seems to contradict the victorious life in Romans 8, 1 through 6. And we're going to, God willing, work our way through Romans 8 as we continue on in our study through this letter over the months ahead. But look at Romans 8, 1 through 6 right now. Paul writes, There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin He condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death." 
but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Life and peace. Is that what Paul's just described in Romans 7, 14 through 25? It doesn't sound like peace. It doesn't sound like life. How are we to understand this? Well, I have appreciated what J.I. Packer has written on this very subject of this very passage. And he uses an illustration of a house that is partially shaded when the sun first arises. If you're on the sunshine side of the house, then you experience the warmth of the sun. But if you're in the section of the house that is shaded, then you don't feel the warmth of the sun, but it's the same house. And what Packer is illustrating here is what Paul is teaching is that a Christian is indeed a person who's been made right with God, justified by God. So all of our sins are completely forgiven. But a Christian continues to deal with sin that remains within. Martin Luther, the wonderful reformer of the 16th century, came to understand this in his own working out of the doctrine of justification by grace through faith in Christ. And he used this phrase that comes across to us in English, that a Christian is at one and the same time both righteous and sinful. Righteous, God's eyes, God's courtroom, declared forever righteous. Never be declared more righteous than you are because of the righteousness of Christ that is yours through faith. And yet sinful because you're not yet perfected. You're not yet completely conformed to Jesus. You will be. You will be. But you're not yet. Well, then what reasons are there to understand Paul describing the life of a Christian in this passage? Well, one of the most significant is the change of tense that we see as he writes from verse 5 and verse 6 through the rest of the chapter. We've already looked at this, but verse Verses 7 through 13 build on verse 5. Paul speaking about the past, his past, other Christians' past experience. Then beginning in verse 14, there's a shift into the present tense. And you'll see this in that passage repeatedly, at least six times. Paul says, I am. I am. Not I was, not I used to be, but what I am right now. Some object and argue that Paul is using the present tense, but he's using it in a grammatical form called the historical present. So he's speaking with present tense verbs, but he's actually referring to something that happened in history. We do this, and the Bible does this sometimes. Uh, For example, I'm going to tell you about a car accident Donna and I had years ago. There I am, I'm sitting in my excursion, and I'm going around a bin, and this truck comes up behind us, and he slams into the back, and we have this accident that caused us a lot of difficulty for several days. Well, I used present tense verses, verbs. Did you hear that? I, here I am, present tense. He crashes, present tense. But I'm talking about something that happened in the past. Now, again, we see this form of communication in the Scriptures, especially in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Mark. But we don't typically see it in Paul. And when we do see it in the Gospels, it's always the way that I just did it. It's telling a story. It's talking about some, it's a narrative section. Paul is not telling a story in Romans 7. Paul is teaching a doctrine. He is making a point to help us understand the nature and utility of God's law in the lives of unbelievers and believers. The most natural reading of this passage is to see it as a shift from Paul describing how the law worked in him before he was born again, verses 5, summary, 7 through 13, exposition, to describing how the law works in him now as a born again Christian, verse 6, summarized, verses 14 through 25, exposition. Paul says these things in this passage, says things in this passage that no unbeliever could say. No unbeliever could ever honestly admit the things Paul admits. So look at verse 17. So now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. An unbeliever can't separate himself from his sin, the sin that dwells in him. Why? Because an unbeliever has sin 
reigning and ruling in his life. Paul here describes himself in ways that separate himself from his sin, his real self and the sin that remains. Look at verse 22. Paul says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. No unconverted person can ever honestly look at God's law and say, yes, I love that law. Why? Because that law condemns him and gives him no hope. No hope. The only way that anyone can look at God's law and say, I delight in the law of God, is to know that law no more condemns me. It cannot send me to hell. On the day of judgment, when that law is read and my life is measured by it, there will be an advocate, Jesus Christ, who steps between me and the condemnation of that law and says, His righteousness is fulfilled, it's complete, it's perfect, it's spotless. And we will live forever on the grace of God given to us in the righteous life of Jesus Christ. We see how Paul describes the life of unbelievers as he's done in the very opening chapters of Romans, especially Romans 1, 18 through 32, that that section of chapter 1. If you just go back and look at that sometime, you'll see how he speaks of those who are outside of Christ, those who are unbelievers, they try to suppress what they ought to know about God, what's evident about God, and they give themselves over to lawlessness. They're not delighting in the law of God, or as we will see in Romans 8, look at verses 7 and 8, if you flip over there, he says, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Hostility to God and the law that comes from God, no desire, no ability to submit to it. Indeed, it cannot. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. No unbeliever would ever honestly be able to say, in my inner soul, I delight in God's law. And then if you look at the end of this text, verse 25, look at this great statement, this cry of victory. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. One unbeliever ever says that. What person who has no interest in Christ, not counting on Christ to reconcile him to God, would say, oh, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, more can be said in making the case for why Paul is talking about his own life as a Christian here. And we will see that, God willing, as we work our way through these verses in weeks ahead. But what I want to just underscore this morning is that he is writing about the experience of a faithful follower of Christ to help us as Christians understand our experience and to appreciate the role of God's law in that experience. What Paul writes here fits with the way the Christian life is described everywhere else in the Bible. A Christian is someone who, though not yet perfect, has been born of God's Spirit, justified in God's courtroom, completely forgiven of sin, granted eternal life, and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And a Christian experiences all of these blessings, not because of his own efforts, but because of Jesus. He doesn't earn any of that. He doesn't deserve any of that. It comes to him by grace, the grace that is found in God giving up his only son to come into the world to bring about such incredible salvation. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, as Paul says to Timothy in one of his letters. He accomplishes his salvation by earning righteousness before the law of God. He did that by keeping God's law perfectly. This is something that we need to think about and remember and regularly remind each other of, that that Jesus didn't have any blemishes. I mean, one of the dangers we have as Christians is we've become so casual about sin. It's just so normal and natural in our lives, and so we can downplay it. And if you're not careful, you can become defeated by it. But as we think about the, the nature of God's law and the perfect righteousness that it requires, we should also be thinking regularly about Jesus did it. He perfectly met it. 
So there's not any condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Your thoughts wonder. My thoughts wonder. You leave things undone and do things that you shouldn't. And I do the same. Well, what keeps us then from being condemned because we're not measuring up to God's law? What keeps us from being condemned is we have a Savior who did. Jesus did it. And our hope is not in our performance. Our hope is in Jesus. And we're just taking God at His word. That as we trust in Jesus, He credits us with this perfect righteousness. Having kept God's law perfectly, Jesus voluntarily laid down His life on the cross to make full atonement for the sins that His people had committed against God. Because the, every sin deserves to be damned to hell. What you and I might call the slightest sin deserves God's wrath. So if Jesus is going to save sinners from sin, He must not only earn the righteousness that is required of us, He must also atone for the unrighteousness that is endemic to us, which He did on the cross. And so when He's on the cross, He is bearing the sins of His people. He is turning to the wrath of God that is being unleashed against sin. And he's absorbing it in himself so that he can pay every last penalty, brothers and sisters, that you and I owe. And when Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, what he is saying is, the transaction's complete. The payment is made in full. There's nothing left for anyone to do who trusts in me, my life, my death. It's as we do trust in Christ that we are declared righteous for His sake. We are born again of His Spirit. We are indwelt by that Spirit. We are given new life. We are reconciled to God for Jesus' sake. And we are then given both the power and the desire to start living lives in pursuit of Him being conformed to Him. Brothers and sisters, we, we have this incredible salvation in Christ. It's all been done for us. It belongs to us not because of what we do, but because of what Christ has done. That's exactly what Paul experienced when he turned from his sin as a self-righteous Pharisee, thinking he was good enough, but not realizing the standard was much higher. And he trusted Christ who met that standard. He was set free. Friend, that salvation is available to you right now. I know we have unbelievers here, and we want you to know we're delighted you're here. We hope you will always come. You're always welcome. But we want you to understand and to believe this good news. Look what God has done for sinners. You and I, we can't measure up to what God requires of us. But Jesus has measured up and He's done it for anyone and everyone who will turn from sin and trust in Him. And so our appeal to you is for the sake of Jesus that you will turn from your sin and be reconciled to your God through Christ. Trust Christ. You don't have to turn over a new leaf. You don't have to clean your life up. Just simply believe the truth. The truth about you. The truth about Jesus. The truth about this incredible good news of what God has done for sinners like you in Jesus. Take God at His word and say, Lord, save me for Christ's sake. Turn from your sin. Confess your sin. Trust Jesus. God will save you. That's what Christianity is. It's what Christians are. Sinners who have been saved by God's grace in Christ. But when you become a Christian, you do not instantly or completely get freed from sin. The sin that once dominated your life continues to remain in your life. That sin no longer rules and reigns, but it does remain. And brothers and sisters, we must fight against that sin that remains. We do so with the power that God gives us through His Spirit. When the Spirit takes up residence in the life of a believer, 
He grants spiritual power to fight against the sin that remains. Paul puts it like this in Romans 8, 13, that by the Spirit we are able to put to death the deeds of the body. So we fight. The Christian life is a spiritual battle. It's a war. And the first and most intense front of that war is not out there in the world. It's not even what the devil and his demons seek to do to us. The first and most intense battle in the spiritual war is what takes place in your own heart and mind and soul with the sin that remains. This is why Paul writes what he does in Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17. He says, I say to you, walk by the Spirit And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Brothers and sisters, we're in a war. And the most intense battlefront of that war is right here. And if we don't understand that, we'll be tempted to get confused, will be knocked off course, and you might think yourself going crazy sometimes, wondering, how come I can't get a handle on my life? Why are my desires for what I know I ought to be and what I really want to be never fully attained? It's because the sin that used to dominate you remains in you. And that sin is not of some lower grade or quality. It's damnable. And we have got to fight against it and put it to death, knowing that victory is ours, will be ours forever. We're not going to fail because we have a Savior who Himself has conquered sin and death and hell. A Christian is a person who's been delivered from the power of sin, from the penalty of sin, but not yet delivered from the presence of sin. We will be. We will be as Paul anticipates in verse 24, who will deliver me from this body of death? Well, Jesus will. The same Jesus who lived for us, died for us, who takes up residence with us by His Spirit, one day will come for us and we'll be done with this body of death. There will be no more sin remaining in us. What Paul's doing in this passage is giving us an honest look inside the life of a Christian who understands and is engaging in the fight against sin. These verses are not a description of unbelievers. An unbeliever doesn't struggle to live righteously before God. These verses are not a description of a defeated believer. There's no hint of defeat in Paul's language here. He's struggling. He's fighting. That's what Christians do. We don't quit. We don't say, well, man, if sin's going to be in my life and my thoughts, and there's nothing I can do uh, to get completely free of sin, then I'm just going to give up and give over to sin. No, that's not the way a Christian thinks. A Christian thinks the way Paul describes himself thinking. I hate every sinful thought. I hate every failure. In my life, I'm not going to sign a peace treaty with my sin. And I look forward to the day when I will be delivered from this body of death, from this world and its sinfulness. And all things will be made new, including me. And I'll be freed, not only from the power and penalty of sin, but from the presence of sin. Paul refuses to consider that the sin that remains in him is any less sinful than it ever was before he became a Christian. So he refuses to downplay it. God's law continues to show him the complete, perfect righteousness that he needs and that now as a Christian, he desires to experience in his own life in perfection. And as he has Christ covering him, interceding for him, having atoned for him, his righteousness credited to him, he determines to continue to fight until the last vestiges of sin are removed from his personal life on that day when Jesus Christ will come for him. Brothers and sisters, this is the paradox of the Christian life. If you don't get this, the the temptations are massive on two sides. One, if you don't understand this paradox, you'll be tempted to downplay sin as no big deal. 
Otherwise, you'll go crazy. Or you'll be tempted to just give up and think, you know, I'm not going to play games anymore. I know what God requires. I know what I am. And so everybody who thinks that they are happy in Christ and they talk about all this stuff, they're just playing games. I'm too honest to do that. Both of those are deadly errors. The way we are to live is to take God at His Word and to understand this paradox that the more you grow in holiness, the more you are aware of how much further you have to grow. The more conformed you become to Jesus Christ, the more you understand of how little you are conformed to Jesus Christ. The holier you become, the more you are aware of your unholiness. It's this paradox that explains why you never find a mature Christian bragging about how holy he or she is. You'll never find anybody that's walked with the Lord a long time growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ throughout that life, talking about how holy they are. This explains why we see the most useful, holiest people in God's kingdom throughout history using language that sometimes sounds foreign to our modern ears. Like William Carey, the father of the modern missionary movement, who left England and gave his life to India so that not only India, but the surrounding nations and throughout southern and and central Asia might come to know the Lord. He translated the, the scriptures into dozens of languages. And when he died... He made sure that this was what was on his tombstone. Born August 7th, 17th, 1761. Died June 9th, 1834. A wretched, poor, and helpless worm. On thy kind arms I fall. Man, did William Carey have a bad self-image? He understood what Paul's talking about here. He got it measuring his life by what God requires of us personally. We are dependent upon grace. We stake our lives on grace and we don't pretend to be other than we are. John Newton, the famous hymn writer, helped end slavery in England. As he neared his death, he said these wonderful words, although my memory's fading, I remember two things quite clearly. I am a great sinner. And Christ is a great Savior. That's the hope of a Christian. This is the inevitable expression of Christian growth and maturity. Paul knew it. Paul experienced it. Track Paul's life through his letters in the New Testament. See how Paul describes himself when he writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that he is the least of the apostles. And then a few years later, he writes in Ephesians 3, I am less than the least of the saints. Well, least of the apostles, okay. I mean, that's kind of humble, right? That means there's these guys above him. He's an apostle, but he's the last one. But now he's saying, you think about all the Christian people in the world? I'm less than the least of those. And then as he comes to his last years, he writes in 1 Timothy 1, I'm the chief of sinners. What's going on with Paul? Did he just backslide? No. He's growing in grace. He's growing in holiness. He's growing in conformity to Christ. And with that growth, he's becoming increasingly aware of how far he has to go. And so as he grows up in Christ, he grows down in his own evaluation of his personal efforts toward holiness. I praise God that Romans 7, 14 through 25 is in the Bible. I praise Him, it's the testimony of a Christian. Because it gives hope to the likes of me. It gives me reason to keep fighting. It gives me reason to keep going. Brothers and sisters, when we became Christians, God's Spirit wrote His law upon our hearts. You were delivered from the curse and the condemnation of the law. You were given a new, genuine desire to keep that law in every aspect of your life. And that's why you grieve over your sins. 
You don't want to sin. You want to be completely freed from the presence of sin. You mourn over your sin. And yet when you mourn, you do so with this hope. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We see our sin. We confess our sin. We can continue to grieve over our sin. How do we become comforted as those who must go on mourning over the sin that remains in us? By looking to the one who took every last one of our sins and bore them away. This sin that we hate, this sin that sometimes, if we're not careful, we think it's going to take us straight to hell. That sin has been paid for by Jesus Christ and we are not condemned. We will never experience hell because of Christ. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We know that the one who began a good work in us will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. This passage helps us to understand what we truly are in Christ. I love what John Murray says about this passage in his book, Principles of Conduct. He writes, The believer is a new man, a new creation, but he is a new man not yet made perfect. Sin dwells in him still, and he still commits sin. He is necessarily the subject of progressive renewal. He needs to be transfigured into the image of the Lord from glory into glory. Because this is true, brothers and sisters, we should be reminded that the Christian life is a life of repentance and faith. We regularly call ourselves believers. We understand that. But we should also be recognizing that we are repenters too. That repentance is an ongoing expression of our lives. Why? Because we have sin that remains in us until we are finally conformed to the image of Jesus Christ perfectly. Because we know this to be true, we don't have to pretend about our sin. We don't have to run from God. We know that we are free from the condemnation of sin. We can confess it. We can turn from it. We can entrust ourselves to our faithful Lord who's purchased us by His own blood. That's what causes Christians to be able to live with hope. We know the day is coming when Jesus Christ will appear, as John says in 1 John 3, and we shall see Him and we will be made like Him then we will sin no more forever. So we continue pressing on in this life, repenting of sin, trusting the Lord Jesus, and we can say unashamedly and confidently with the Apostle Paul, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for such a great salvation. We pray that you would help us to think rightly always about how your grace to us in Jesus is operating in our lives. Don't let us play games. Don't let us pretend to be something we're not. And don't let the reality of the remaining sin within us overwhelm us. But oh God, every time we see our sin, we pray that you would take us to Christ and help us to see in him the forgiveness of sins. We want to fight like Paul. We want to wage war against sin. So help us by your spirit to do exactly that. For Jesus' sake, amen.